Right, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize to Harper Lee for shamelessly appropriating her great work of literature for the purpose of making a bad pun. And second of all, I'd like to clarify that I'm not really here to kill anything, um, least of all your favorite mocking frameworks. What I'd like to do is to share some techniques which I found useful uh, when testing code which issues callbacks. So callbacks have many uses and tend to be used often. The, co the code snippet showed here is an example of a callback from the standard library. We define the callback in the terms in the form of a lambda, which is passed as a parameter to standard accumulate, and it's called accordingly. So this illustrates two important properties of callbacks, namely that they are provided by the client somehow, and also they have a well-defined interface. So this talk is about writing tests for code which issues callbacks, or calls callbacks if you like. So let's look at an example. Um, Here's some source code which tokenizes input. Now, I'm not going to claim that this is exactly a masterpiece of software engineering, but hopefully the intent is fairly clear, namely that it, uh, a callback is called for each whitesmith, white space delimited token in the input. The class is templated on the type of the callback object, uh, as, and it stores a reference to that instance, as you, which you can see in the first highlighted line. This is, in my experience anyway, a fairly common thing to do. So many alternative designs exist, and possibly some of them might be preferable in this case. At the second highlighted line, there's a call to a member function string token with a single argument, namely the contents of the found token. Also note, this, this is the only output from the tokenizer. It doesn't return any values or modify any global state. So how do we write a test case? We can construct a test suite which provides various inputs to the code under test and checks the results. But how do we check that the callback is called in the right way or even at all? If, and if the callback needs to return values to the caller, how do we provide them? The most common solution is to use a mock, which is a test-only component that implements the callback interface in such a way to enable verification of the calling code. Mocking frameworks exist to make mocking easier. And Google Mock is one such framework. And here's how you might use it to verify the token tokenizer. Here, we're defining and instantiating a mock object and passing it into the token tokenizer, all from our fixture class. We, we declare a string token as a mocked function using the mock method one macro. So in each test case, all that is left to do is to specify input to the tokenizer and the expectations on the callback. To do this, we use the expect call macro. So Google Mock, like most mocking frameworks, uses a declarative syntax for specifying the calls we expect on the callback. In this case, we're expecting the string token member function to be called exactly once with a single argument, hello. Google Mock provides matches, which is a domain-specific language for describing expectations on mocked functions. So here are some examples of, of, of these, all from the documentation. Now, the key point that I want to point out here is the, the declarative syntax. So provided you understand how to read and write them, you can concisely express the expectations on your mocked functions. So as you're looking at these examples, please imagine how they might be representative, represented alternatively in the form of vanilla C++ code. Now, if you went to Ben Dean's talk yesterday, you would have heard him make the reasonable case that DSL readability and simplicity is enhanced through the use of operator overloading. Uh, it's possible to imagine an intuitive and concise DSL which, expresses, which uses expression trees, for example, uh, for exp expressing expectations on mocks. I'm not aware of any mocking frameworks to do so, but maybe it's an opportunity for someone. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out the importance of the test code being, being readable. So test code, by definition, needs to be correct by inspection. And if the DSL ex, um, ex obscures the intent of the test, it becomes less valuable. So comparing to Google Mark, I would argue that in many cases, expectations are more clearly expressed in the form of imperative code 
This may come at the cost of some concision, but hopefully the, tra the benefit of ad added clarity would be worth it. But I would like you to judge for yourself in, in the following slides as we explore how to design and use mocks in standard C++. So here's a different way to design the mock. So we define our mock object using std function member variables. From the point of view of the calling code, these behave identically to real member functions, uh, modulo some limitations which I'll describe later. However, using a std function allows us to define on a per test case basis the behavior of the, the mock object. In, this, in the test case, we declare a lambda which is then bound to the string token std function. This lambda serves to verify our expectations on the calls to string token. Specifically, when string token is called, the argument must be the string hello, otherwise the test fails. There's no DSL here, at least none beyond that used by our UDA testing framework. This is just C++ code and hopefully fairly easy to understand. Now, you can even set a breakpoint in here, which is sometimes incredibly useful. Um, the other thing to note is that a std function will throw an exception if called unbound. This is a really useful feature because it will result in a test failure if the callback is called unexpectedly. Now, mocking frameworks use the term strict for such mocks, um, and some allow for so-called nice mocks, which don't have this property, meaning that unexpected callbacks will not result in a test failure. Um, personally, I have never found a reason to use such nice mocks, but in any case, it's possible to bind empty lambdas uh, to your std functions in the fixture constructor. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to hand wave away the issue of return values for the rest of the talk. Uh, even though we're returning void here, um, you can hopefully see that the lambda could return any value uh, as required for the test. Now, the last thing to point out on this slide is the mysterious function called expect calls. The intent here is to ensure that the lambda is called the expected number of times, i.e. 1. And this check is crucial. We want the test to fail if the callback is not called at all or called too many times. So how do we write expect calls? Well, the basic idea is we're going to use the decorator pattern. So we decorate a test lambda with an object that's going to check our expected number of calls to that lambda. Uh, to do this, we're going to first create a helper class called decorated callable. The idea is to combine a decorator and a callable object such that we call a decorator function before we call the callable itself. Uh, there's some details to get right here, but hopefully the, the, this should be fairly straightforward. Next, I'm going to define this thing called call count checker, which will decorate all of our test lambdas. So the idea is that each time the call count checker is called, it increments a counter. And then in the destructor, we check that the count matches the expected value. The implementation of expect calls is now fairly straightforward. You return a decorated callable containing a call count checker and the test lambda passed in. At the end of the test case, the mock object will be destroyed and the call count will be checked. However, there's a problem, as you can kind of understand from the comment there. Um, because we're binding to a std function, we need the object to be copyable. And this is a hard requirement of std function, actually. Uh, and indeed, our object is technically copyable, but as it is written here, it doesn't really make any semantic sense for it to be copyable. Because if you were to copy it, you would have to call this, the copy this, the expected number of times as well as the original. Otherwise, you'd get a test failure, obviously. Um, the, other, the other sort of limitation that we'd like to note here is that the, uh, we'd like to also record the location in the test where we, where we use expect calls uh, so that we can issue a more meaningful error message. Um, so solving this copying problem is fairly easy. We just move the relevant state into an object uh, which, which is shared amongst all instances of the call count checker. Um, and as you can see here, we're also capturing the source location uh, so that it can be reported when an error occurs. Um, I'm using this thing called std experimental source location. Uh, it's available in GCC, but not playing, unfortunately. Um, but in the absence of this, we could simulate it with preprocessor macros. So putting all that state inside an object, which is owned by std pointer, let's just generate as many copies, uh, so, sorry, owned by std shared pointer, 
uh, lets us generate as many copies as we like and call count will be checked against the expected value when the last instance is deleted. So this all works as expected. Um, you can see here we're calling, uh, we're, we're setting up an expectation that a string token will be called once, but then we don't call it and the error message is uh, fairly self-explanatory. Note it also includes the source location. Um, obviously this would be, uh, it would be ideal if we only reported the location of the lambda, but I don't know a way to do that with this particular unit testing framework. Um, and before we move on, um, I'd just like to emphasize the, re-emphasize the importance of checking the call count. Um, doing so ensures that the test lambdas are executed, and this mitigates a significant source of defects. Of course, there may be bugs in the test code itself, but if you can ensure that it is at least executed, you do re significantly reduce your risk of, t of false positives. So, hopefully everyone's happy so far. Um, what happens when your callback is called multiple times with different parameters? Uh, in the above example, we expect std token to be called once with hello and then again with world. Uh, as shown here, you could bind a new instance of expect calls from within another. This actually does work and may be a useful technique in some circumstances. In my opinion though, a better approach would be something like this. Um, we first define our expected values in an array and then define a mutable lambda which captures an iterator to the start of the array. Each time it's called, it checks the value passed against the dereferenced iterator and then increments the iterator. Uh, in this case, we would want to guard against the callback being called three times, but hopefully you get the picture anyway. Now, what happens if you don't know the order in which the calls will come? For example, you expect two calls to your callback, but you don't know which will come first. So currently, our tokenizer delivers its tokens in the order they are found in the input. But let's just say that the order, ordering of tokens is unspecified. So if we, were to, if we were to test for a specific order of tokens, we would be over-constraining the code under test. In other words, generating false negatives if the implementation were to change. Fortunately, standard containers can ha handle such non-deterministic ordering. So here we use a std set of expected values, uh, and we remove values from the set once they are seen. So if we see the same value twice, or we see an unexpected value, the call to a race will return zero, and that will fail the test. Okay, so let's enhance our tokenizer a little bit. Um, this is version two, and it now attempts to convert each token to an integer, um, and if it's successful, it calls a new callback called int token. If not successful, it calls string token as before. Again, I'm not claiming this is great code. So to test this, we can still use a standard sequence container of expected values, but this time we, we can wrap them in a std variant. The mock function is defined as a polymorphic lambda and hence will accept either type of argument, string view or int. Using decl type, uh, we recover the type passed and then we use std get if uh, to check that it matches the expected type. Then, of course, to check that it matches the expected value. So, we have here an implicit ordering between the callbacks, so that the test will fail if int token is called before string token. But in some cases, uh, you might prefer to expose the current call count so that you can check explicitly. For example, we could rewrite the previous test such that within the int token callback, we can check the call count for string token uh, to make sure that it is one. Now, of course, we have the call count for each mocked function inside the call count checker. But unfortunately, that's now type erased uh, within the std function, which means we can't get to it. Fortunately, though, there's a solution here which we just uses the code we have written so far, but rearranges it slightly. To recap, what we've got here currently is a test lambda, which is decorated with a call count checker and the result is then bound into a std function and type erased. But what if we decorated the std function itself? 
there are two enhancements we need to make to the call count checker. Firstly, uh, it needs to be default constructible. This is because we need to instantiate the mock object in the fixture before binding it to the lander in the text, test case. So fundamentally, all we need to do there is to just change the state object in, which, inside the call count checker so that the expected call count is now optional, which means it can be default constructed. Secondly, we need to add assignment operators uh, to the call count checker and the, de the decorated callable so that when we assign the result of expected calls to the mock function, we assign a new call count checker and we assign the lambda into the std function. As I've sort of tried to show here, both of those things replace on the right, replace the things on the left. So this is counted function, which basically packages up a std function with a call count checker. It's declared in a similar manner to std function and is intended to be used in the same way. You can change the mock object to use this instead of std function and it should not break any existing tests. However, it does add a current count accessor, which you can use from within your test case. As a further benefit, we now cannot forget to use expect calls uh, because the assignment operator requires a compatible decorated callable, which the raw lambda is not. So I'm skipping over a lot of details here, but there's full code available on a GitHub repo. Um, putting it all together, we create our mock object in the familiar way. All right, so the mock, object, the mock callback class is populated uh, with counted functions instead of std functions. Other than that, it's identical. And now we can access the current count of each mock function from anywhere in the test case. This allows for much more flexibility in terms of how we test the order in which callbacks are issued. And you can just imagine that it just might be more generally usable. Okay, so let me get back to some of the other limitations and workarounds that you need to be aware of when you're using std function uh, to create mock objects. Uh, the first limitation is obviously overloading. So if your callback function signature is overloaded or it has default parameters, you just can't use a std function directly. Um, as a workaround, you could define what I call trampoline functions uh, that resolve those overloads. And uh, this is quite tedious, of course, um, but if we had a std overloaded function, it would solve the problem. Uh, I don't have time to describe it, but it is possible. Um, and there is a thing in boost called boost overloaded function. Uh, it doesn't quite do the job, but it, it sort of forms the, the, uh, the basic idea. Um, another limitation is uh, virtual functions, which you can't override a virtual function using a std function member variable. Uh, and in this case, you just, you need, you need the trampoline function pretty much. Uh, and the best workaround I can suggest is to use a preprocessor macro, but this, this should be fairly simple. Uh, and it should just eliminate the repetition here. So I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, another annoyance, uh, if not an outright limitation, is the repetition, um, specifically in the parameter types. So uh, in this example, each test case which mocks out the function foo has to, define, uh, has to declare and define a lambda which accepts all of the argument types, namely a spring token, an int, and a double. And you may, may rapidly become bored writing lambdas with this signature. For the purposes of defining a lambda, you could just declare your parameters as auto, um, but this isn't really a big a, necessarily a great solution. The other important thing to be aware of is that if you want to change the function signature, of a callback, like adding a fourth parameter, for example, yet all of your existing test lambdas will have to change. Um, but maybe that's a good thing. I mean, uh, you almost certainly need to change the, the, the lambdas anyway to check that, they, uh, that the correct values are being passed. Uh, after you change the callback signature, your compiler will gently remind you which lambdas need to be updated, or maybe not so gently. Um, and admittedly, I have a bias in favor of low arity functions, so I don't see this as necessarily a big limitation. Um, functions, I prefer the functions, to, especially callback functions, to have no more than two to three parameters. And I find if I want to add a, th a fourth, or possibly just a third, uh, then I almost certainly want to start thinking about wrapping those parameters in a struct or tuple. Uh, 
This would also address the limitation in um, the repetition in defining the lambdas, although then you would still need to update each one to check the values that it get passed. Okay, so I've presented lots of details here, um, but I've got some takeaways for you. Um, the first one that I really want to home, hammer home on is the, uh, the, the, the importance of dis distinguishing between uh, declarative and imperative syntax. And you should really consider whether, which is best for your tests and for your team. Um, I don't necessarily think it's uh, a given that you should take either one, in fact. Uh, std function can be used to build mock objects, um, but you really need to be, pay attention to ensure that the std functions actually get called. Um, in combination with these, std uh, the standard containers uh, are useful for representing sequences of expectations, and I think you can build up your, your tests accordingly. Um, and the last thing I guess there is that uh, decorators uh, are useful sometimes, so it's good to know about decorators. Um, okay, uh, that's sort of the material I had. Um, there's a bunch of, bunch of ways to find me if you want to find out more, particularly that link there to GitHub is, the, um, is where I posted the code to this, to this talk. Um, you can feel free to, I, I, I don't feel like I need to make it a library. Uh, obviously that's, um, you know, the, I feel like the code that I posted on GitHub is free for appropriation. You should feel to appropriate it as if it were a great work of literature and you needed a title for a talk in a conference, for instance. Um, there's a picture of a cat for no reason. Um, and I'd really like to have some comments or questions or comments disguised as questions or any of the above, really. So um, that's, uh, that's, pr that's pretty much it. Thanks. Do you want to use the mic? Sorry. What about just outputting the calls you received to a queue or something and then checking it afterwards? Um, yep, definitely possible. Um, the reason I like to, uh, it's a bit more boilerplate, I guess, but the reason I like to have it as a, as a as lambda, you can actually put a breakpoint on there and just inspect the, the state of the system uh, right there and then. But yeah, it's perfectly possible to do that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned GCC and Clang. Uh, you did not mention MSVC for the experimental source. Is that uh, not because it doesn't exist or you did not test? Uh, I did not test. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, well, thanks very much for coming.